All right, thanks. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm Amy O'Hara. I work in the Massive Data Institute here at the McCord School of Public Policy. A little bit of background, I'm an economist by training, but for most of my career, I worked at the US Census Bureau leading their data acquisition linkage curation unit. In doing that, like Gail said, there was so much trust building and that had to occur at so many levels. And I was doing it the old school way. Let's get a data use agreement. Let's get the data with identifiers. Let's lock it onto this machine. Let's have people use that data, clean it up, sanitize it, push it over to that machine. And it took all of these steps and that works, but there are ways to do that a little different, a little better. And so for years, I was hearing about these other technologies and being introduced to other people other than statisticians and social scientists. So you meet the cryptographers and you meet the ethicists and the philosophers and you meet a lot of lawyers. And you try to figure out how am I going to, like you need a rose at a stone. How are we going to begin to get people speaking the same language, not talking past each other? And the big question was like, what's the value proposition there? Why? Why are we gonna change what we're doing? Please don't rock this boat. It took us like decades to get to where we are. What is the value proposition for changing what we are doing in any way? And that's something that I hope that as a community, we get better at answering. Because sometimes you say, we're gonna be able to do it with more privacy protection. People just look at you. I haven't had a breach. Why would I need to do that? And so we need better answers to that than we have right now. Or you say, we'll be able to unlock data that you can't currently access. And they say, well, that's impossible. And you just say, no, no, no. I wanna talk about that realm of impossibility. I wanna start talking about what are the things that we could be doing that will get us to that next step. And sometimes that's gonna be a little baby step and sometimes that's gonna be a giant leap. And it's up to us to figure out when it is appropriate to take those bigger steps and also to make sure that we're not breaking anything in the process. So the one thing I would like to, to come back to what Dale said, he said that we wanna end the day uh, around four. I said I wanna end the day a little after four at Kelly's down the street. So we'll, we'll see how that all goes. Uh, but my part of the, the program here is to start doing a very basic introduction, and I'm hopeful that I will get slides. If not, I'll talk about it. But I'm here to start talking about, when we say PPPs, what are we talking about? What are these privacy-preserving technologies? Uh, you will sometimes hear people talk about pets, privacy-enhancing technologies, but when I start talking about that, people think I'm talking about actual animals. But I. Uh, the one thing that I have learned about introducing the people that are currently using data to privacy enhancing technologies or privacy preserving technologies is that they don't understand what they're currently doing and therefore they don't understand the realm of the possible. And so when you speak to people and they say, well, I don't do any of that. And then you find out that they are caching or that they are using an intermediary where they've basically outsourced some of that privacy enhancing work to another party, getting them to understand that they might already be introduced to and actually implementing some of these technologies. That's really part of, again, another part of our challenge here. But then when you think about the, the education process that we need to embark on, they hear a lot of hype, they hear a lot of lingo. Uh, when you speak to institutions, they hear things like blockchain. Do I need that? Do I not need that? So it's beginning to get people introduced to the, the possibilities of hashing their identifiers if they're currently doing things in the clear. Thinking about how they're going to begin protecting their data, whether it's the input data, the actual student records, or if it's what they're attempting to publish. And we, here with my colleague Stephanie Strauss there in the back, we did a bit of a study here in, into what is currently going on in the education space. And we learned that many people are doing, as I mentioned before, a lot of work in the clear. They're doing it old school. 
the challenge that I think I heard the most is they thought they had to wholly discard what they were doing, completely abandon what was in place in order to switch to the new world of privacy enhancing technologies. And I think that they don't understand that you would be able to then move through that, move through the process and retain a lot of what they're currently doing, but implementing different aspects with more either cryptographic control or with better protection of the data that's going out into the wild when the publications are made. Where are we? Now we have slides. Uh, am I gonna be able to say advanced slide? Or next slide? Oh, or no, that's the one you get. Make, make the best of that one. But, uh, oh, I love the next one. The next one is just, where are we and how do we get to there? When I mentioned, thank you very much. When I mentioned the, the study that Steph and I were doing, one would speak to people in institutions. It really didn't matter if we were speaking to people at K-12 or at higher ed uh, or at nonprofits. They felt that they were that individual there and they knew what they were doing and we were talking about something in the distant future and they see no bridge to get there. And again, part of the challenge with the community, what do we need to do? We need to explain, for some people, yeah, it really might be a large, a, like a hard trek through dangerous terrain, and for others, we might be able to make a zip line to get there, it depends what you're trying to do. But time and again, when we speak to people in institutions, they see it as this nebulous goal that it has no bridge to get there. So I've already mentioned, here to talk about privacy preserving technologies. These are the crypto cryptographic approaches that you're gonna be using to protect data. Again, it could be student data, it could be adjacent data that might have juvenile justice, it might have uh, 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 occupational and labor market outcomes whenever you're trying to look at longer range outcomes for people with different degree programs. Lots of ways to protect that data. And as I mentioned before, most people are already doing something. They're probably using some sort of statistical disclosure limitation. It could be rounding, it could be suppression, but it, it is something that can help them evolve from what they're currently doing. So what protects data now? When we speak to people in institutions, a lot of them say, well, I protect it by not giving it to anybody because I don't trust anybody. And so they very securely sit on top of their data. As I mentioned before, some people are using a trusted third party to outsource this work, and then they don't internalize that it's happening, but they are using intermediaries. And those are institutions or organizations that have somehow earned their trust or have established reputations that make them feel comfortable in doing that. Other organizations are using contracts, they're using the law. They have non-disclosure agreements, they have data licenses to let people use their data for specific purposes for particular time durations. And as I mentioned a minute ago, even when you're producing the outputs, whether it's statistics or different files, you are probably applying some sort of statistical disclosure limitation already, even if you're not very well versed in what that is, what it's doing, what it's protecting. But what more could be done? Right now, there are a lot of people that are sharing their data around with the PII, and that is a risk that could potentially be better mitigated through privacy preserving technologies. Uh, there are ways to do privacy preserving record linkage right now that are quick. They are not the technologies that used to exist say 10 years ago, which would have been very wonky, very slow, not effective. You could have a trusted execution environment, whether that is something that you are using, that you are using a vendor to help support or something that your intermediary implements for you. Something that's a bit further, uh, not as readily used, secure multi-party computation. This is where you have two groups that have lists. They don't trust each other, but they agree that a computation can occur. You could do a private center intersection to understand who is in my list, who is in Mark's list, and get some simple statistics about them, and do that without me exposing my list to him or his to me, because we don't trust each other in that world. Uh, so there are also ways that when you're producing the statistics, these are the outputs that are gonna go into the world. 
how do you reduce re-identification risk there beyond just suppression, you know, not putting that number in the cell and putting an asterisk. Instead, here's where you could begin to apply things like differential privacy, formal privacy, ways so that your attack uh, vectors that you know of now and those into the future are not going to compromise the identities of the people in the data. Something else you hear about is the, the potential of synthetic data and are you going to be able to basically make the entire file noisy so that a, an attacker would not be able to recover the actual identities of anybody in that data? So these are some of the examples of what could be done. And this is something that Stephanie and I came up with, and we put it onto the spectrum. Some of these are more useful toward the top, less useful toward the bottom, more widely used to the right, less widely used to the left. And this is, you know, a, a two by two, and wouldn't it be great if we were all getting up there into that top right? Uh, and this was our assessment of the maturity and the utility for education data. Now, I might have a slightly different take on this if we were talking about, say, health data, clinical health data, uh, or potentially different types of justice data. But this, our study was really trying to focus on education and thinking about the breadth of institutions that would need to be involved using privacy-enhancing technologies. And in that top right, you see the secure hashing, the differential privacy, and also secure multi-party for certain applications. But I want to pop down to that bottom left. These are the ones that we don't see widely used in applications. And in our estimation, perhaps would be a bit less useful until perhaps there's greater maturity of all of the privacy-enhancing tech. And that's where I'd put blockchain and zero knowledge proofs for now. But if we got to a world that had greater use of distributed ledger or had a lot more secure multi-party or had functional and efficient homomorphic encryption, then you would see the greater need for zero knowledge proofs. But that's just kind of how we see the world. And we do have that little star there on that bottom right. There are currently a lot of intermediaries and they're, they're protecting the data. Like I said before, it's outsourcing the work but they are uh, using a lot of these different tools and techniques. And I think that it would be a value to everybody if they were a bit more transparent. I don't think they're hiding it. I just think they probably don't want to confuse their customers, but they need to get the customers understanding when they're already hashing the data, when they have a mature trusted ex execution environment, things like that, when they are creating synthetic data to train their models it's something that you get the people that are using these services to better understand and eventually trust. Oops. Uh, so we did a bit of landscape, and in our report that we sent out in advance of this meeting, we did find that there are a number of privacy-preserving technologies that are being used or tested in the education domain. The full list of them is there in our, in our report. And in that report, we also go through some of them and we try to break it down for people that might be less, uh, less informed about these different technologies and showing the pros, what it can do, and the cons, what it can't do yet or what it's uh, not protecting. So I would encourage you to take a look at that where we walk through, as I said before, these are some of the ones that were in that more useful, more implemented, the secure hashing and the differential privacy. And then we also do the same, uh, in, in secure multi-party was also in that top right, and then trusted execution environments as well. What they can protect, who is going to get best utility out of implementing them into their current workflow. So we also looked at what are the barriers? Why isn't everybody doing this? If the technology is there, if it works, if it's something that could just help you evolve your current process into something that is more privacy preserving, what's holding you back? And there are a lot of actual and perceived legal barriers. There's a big difference there. This is where someone says, I can't do that, it's against the law. And you gotta say, show me, come on, I wanna see your statute, I wanna see that civil code. I want you to show me where it says that you cannot do what we are talking about. Because most of the time it's an interpretation of that statute. There are also institutional barriers. We don't have the right buy-in, we don't have the resources, and those are things that can be approached through policy or change uh, that might be induced because you see what your peer institutions are doing. The next are technical barriers, and these are uh, something that Stephanie and I heard two main types about. One, 
I don't have the people to do it, and I don't know what I'm talking about. So they were saying, my technical barrier is I'm interested. I would like to do this, but I can't. I don't have the abilities right now to do it. And another more technical, technical barrier is when someone looks at the privacy enhancing technology and they say, that's nice, but it doesn't do what I want. So something like secure multi-party, it's gonna be great if you're gonna be doing some descriptive statistics. It's not gonna be great if you have some super complex uh, multi-level model that you wanna run. So there are, some of these technologies are still evolving and maturing, but the, the technical barriers we heard are really that, how do I do it? Or they are, how do I make it compute what I need computed? Finally, on the right there, this is probably the hardest nut to crack, the cultural barriers. So this is when someone says, we just don't do that, or that's not how we do it, or we're never gonna be able to do that. The cultural barriers are something that needs, from our experience, are often overcome where they see a peer institution testing something and succeeding. So this is where we have heard that people say we need more demonstrations of how privacy enhancing tech works. They need to be able to see themselves in those implementations so that they will say, well, maybe I'm willing to test this. We've also seen, and I've seen this in other domains, that when you finally begin to crack the cultural barriers there, you end up getting dumped into legal, institutional, and technical, but it is really a foundational uh, challenge that must be addressed to get people more willing to say, I see what I'm currently using, I see what the possibility is, and how do I move through this? Uh, as we're doing this work, I've identified a couple of aligned initiatives and crosswinds. These are things that are going to either speed us on our course or they're going to slow us down. Likely all of the above all at the same time. So a critical aligned initiative is the National Secure Data Service. Here's what the implementation of the Evidence Act. This is the feds, okay? And the, the challenge that I have when I think about education is that there's a bunch of activity that goes on at the federal level for a national picture, but then all of the data and a lot of the, the technical, cultural, and institutional barriers are not happening at that federal level. It's, the data are being held much more local. But a national secure data service will be this, uh, this organization service providing that helps with data linkages, helps with data governance, helps identify data sources, and there's a report coming out later this month talking about the recommendations for what a national secure data service can look like. In addition, for privacy and, and privacy enhancing technologies are definitely going to be in those recommendations because I was the chair of the subcommittee that was writing them. So unless somebody goes in and redacts pretty much all of my work for two years, there will be something about privacy enhancing technology in there. The next bullet on there, there is UN work and there is US-UK collaboration about privacy enhancing tech, trying to get more demonstration products going, uh, projects going. And then also the National Research Cloud, people have been exploring uh, what can be done there. There's a great report that came out of a group that the folks at Stanford were leading. Those are aligned initiatives. Those could propel us forward. But against us, you could have things like the Parent Bill of Rights and people saying no. Don't use the data, don't like sit on it, sit on it tight. Uh, then you also have news cycles. If there's a breach, there's ransomware and people say, I'm gonna sit on my data, I'm gonna sit on it really tight. In addition, you have companies coming along and saying, I have a solution that's gonna protect all of your data. And so if you are a data controller, you have to be able to deal with that hype and someone promising something, whether it's legit or not, and you need to be able to figure out if that is a solution that could work for you. The next one is something that's a bit removed, but I think it's really critical. Disaggregated data for equity. Everybody wants to understand what's going on at a more granular level. But with everything else that I have just said, that is an enormous challenge. Because you want to be able to produce that accurate information sliced and diced to really understand what's going on. 
But that is going to be one of those output privacy problems. Whenever you produce that statistic and release it into the wild, it's likely highly disclosive. If it is as granular as you want it to be, it is likely highly disclosive. So as a community, what's the answer there? Are we going to release something that is noisy? Are we going to suppress it and not release anything at all? Are we going to release multiple implicates of it so that you can look across them? Are you going to make it harder for somebody to use and interpret the data? Or are you going to make it easy, but it's going to have an asterisk that it might be unreliable? So I think that it's really a challenge for all of us to think about how we're protecting privacy on those outputs and how, we, how easy we want it for, to be for people to use them. And then for everything here, staffing. When we spoke to institutions, it didn't matter at what level, they're like, this has been a rough stretch of years. We've lost so many people. We have these gaps. People are doing multiple jobs. There's work that isn't getting done. Where's the pipeline? How are we going to get all of this work done? And when I've spoken to people at the federal level, they're like, I'm really reluctant to contract some of this out because I don't even have my procurement people that are going to help me man those contracts. So thinking through the staffing, and again, here is something where I hope that through some field building and community building that we can get to there to understand how we might be able to help each other fill gaps in these pipelines right now. So those are some of my overview remarks about these things do exist. They are ready for prime time, depending on what you're doing. They are being used in some places. And we have an opportunity in the next few years to accelerate them, but then a lot of forces out of our control to get a lot of things to blow up that people put on the brakes and say, no, not my data, not what I'm going to do. So how do we manage all of these opportunities as well as these risks? And I hope that we can talk about that today. During the day here online, I would invite the people to pipe up, be part of the conversation, uh, but also in the room so that we can get a little bit more networking across different groups. If you have any questions, I am game to take them. Uh, I think that we are also going to tee up another presentation to talk more about AI. I will um, just start if you have a question with a little personal introduction to help put my uh, remarks in context um, and let you know that um, so my job is essentially to, to <laughs> Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> so I was saying I'll. Um, start by giving a little bit of a personal introduction to put my remarks in context. Uh, but I think my principal job this morning, I think, is representing the EdSafe AI um, Alliance and, um, and to preach to the choir. Uh, uh, I think for the folks who uh, chose to make time out of, uh, out of your schedules to join us for this conversation today. Uh, my name is Jim Laramore. I serve as the Chief Officer for Equity and Learning at an AI and education startup, uh, Red Labs. I also am one of the co-founders for the EdSafe AI Alliance. And the background that I would share kind of on that in terms of the, the organizational element of this uh, is that I'm a, a career educator, kind of uh, worked in post-secondary education for quite a long time. My uh, family cultural background is, and personal story is, I think, an element of, of the career journey that I have been on. Uh, we're uh, Comanche and Scots-Irish Texans on my dad's side of the family, Japanese on my mother's side of the family. Uh, my siblings and I are first generation college graduates. Uh, and growing up in a multiracial, multicultural uh, household uh, with a mother who came to the US uh, just after World War II uh, and uh, is a Japanese immigrant living in exotic places like Leavenworth, Kansas and El Paso, Texas, uh, where she faced a fair amount of hostility uh, just by virtue of her presence. Uh, as kids growing up, and my, and my dad had different experiences as a Comanche man growing up in West Texas, just across the Oklahoma uh, border from our uh, uh, uh,
<laughs> okay. I think it may be working then. So I'm glad that it was just a technical glitch. I was a little worried that uh, we may be a little closer to the NSA headquarters than I was, <laughs> than was thinking. And I must have triggered some kind of keyword. Um, but in any event, uh, I, I grew up um, as a participant in the US public educational system and as a critic of it, uh, because I saw things uh, happening with my peers. Uh, I think we had my own personal experiences. And so I've carried that experience into my uh, life and my work as an educator in asking questions about systems and how they're put together, how organizations are put together, whose interests they really serve. And then uh, as I became an education administrator, I was the, um, an assistant dean and director for the American Indian Program out at Stanford for a number of years, became a dean of student affairs uh, at a number of different institutions. And it was, for me, a journey into understanding uh, the taken for granted nature of some of the processes and rules and definitions that we operate with, uh, which frankly don't serve our students very well, or don't serve many of our students very well. Uh, so uh, as a sociologist by training, I, I mentioned to Amy, as we were getting to know each other just before the session, uh, that I am a non-technical person who's increasingly gotten involved in education technology in large measure to ask questions about um, you know, why we're approaching things a certain way, what kind of issues or barriers we might um, encounter given some of the ways that we do things. But from an organizational perspective, and I'll, I'll say this a little tongue in cheek, um, <clears throat> if you set out to design a system that was more complicated uh, than the US educational system, <laughs> you would have to be a genius. Uh, uh, if you look at, um, a system that, uh, that structurally is so consistent at producing uh, subpar results, uh, you know, uh, not delivering a quality education to large numbers of students consistently from one year to the next, you couldn't design a system that is more perfectly suited uh, to deliver the same crappy results year after year uh, than we have in our educational system. And one of the things that we can do uh, to get to a, a higher level of performance or to close uh, gaps in achievement and equity is to really ask questions about the things that we have inherited and how well they're working, uh, who they're working for, and who they are not working uh, well for. And <clears throat> so coming into the technology uh, realm, uh, what I have found is that I, I'm um, uh, both intrigued by technology and trying to become more and more hype resistant uh, because I, I've heard uh, all manner of different things, and, I, and I'll, I'll focus on AI or artificial intelligence as one part of this. Uh, AI has been uh, promised as the panacea to all of our problems. Uh, and a, the combination of AI and big data are often promoted as being uh, uh, bias or barrier free uh, in, the, in the potential that they hold for us. And <clears throat> so actually I think, uh, Lauren, I will not use the slides because I think that uh, folks who are uh, here understand that you know when we talk about AI we tend to talk about families of things so uh, computer vision whether or not uh, the technology has the ability to see or perceive uh, certain things and then digitize the you know the data or pull uh, some you know, data together from that whether it can uh, hear and whether we can use natural language processing uh, to uh, you know create another input stream of data uh, whether uh, it is capable of doing very fast computation uh, through machine learning, uh, deep learning uh, algorithms, and other things. Uh, and it's basically a way for us to try to um, you know, gather input or gather data to make sense of the world that we are trying to um, improve. Uh, what um, I think you know, we encounter as uh, one uh, type of a barrier with that is that very often the people who are designing uh, the technology and thinking about you know, the coding that becomes algorithms <coughs> Um, is that uh, they're uh, typically not people who have a deep understanding of education or learning. Uh, so we end up with some issues there. You know, I, I like to um, uh, kind of joke around that there are really only three things that could possibly go wrong uh, in the use of AI in education. Uh, one is that we have data that could be problematic. Uh, the second is that we have algorithms that aren't really carefully constructed that may not be well suited uh, to their purposes. And the third is that there could be you know, problems um, in terms of the outputs or the inferences that are drawn uh, based <coughs> on the use of AI, uh, in which case we end up with operator error. 
So if it's the data, the algorithms, or the people involved in the process, beyond that, we're pretty good. Right? <laughs> right? We're, we're on pretty, pretty safe ground. Uh, but those are big uh, things for us to take into account. Um, in, um, in hearing Amy's comments this morning, I, I think I would probably put uh, or maybe an, an add-on to the um, institutional barriers that we have. And this is really kind of pulling up at a more systemic or structural level. Um, U.S. education is made up of uh, a certain finite number of very large public school districts and a whole bunch of medium-sized and then smaller districts. But we also have out in rural parts of the country what a friend of mine in Missouri refers to as itty-bitty districts, like very, very small districts. And the level of technical capability uh, or bandwidth you know, diminishes as you move into those smaller, um, more rural or remote environments. So uh, from an equity perspective, we have a, we have a series of gaps all right, that we have to mine. The same thing happens in higher education. You know, I, I cut my teeth. I went to an open enrollment a public institution as an undergrad in Texas. I did my graduate work and, uh, at Stanford, and then my professional career was mainly in the very well-funded, private, uh, highly selective institutions. It was, uh, uh, I think, what Paul LeBlanc from Southern New Hampshire would describe as kind of a tweener existence. I was an imposter uh, visiting in these places that had more resources than I ever knew existed as a kid growing up. But um, in those environments, uh, there is more capacity or bandwidth. It's kind of hard to sometimes marshal or mobilize uh, to get people to focus on the same kinds of issues, but you can do it. It's a radically different situation if you get to an underfunded public institution or into a community college. Uh, and so I think from a design perspective, when we think about uh, big data, when we think about the use of AI, we really have to push to think about, you know, beyond what the market might be attracted to or what companies might be attracted to, to think about the larger market that we're trying to serve and then to design for that, right? Uh, so that would, I, I think, on a structural level be one way of looking at this. Uh, I, I know uh, my um, uh, former colleague and, and uh, friend, Michelle Barrett, uh, brings an unusual combination of experiences having uh, both training as an engineer, uh, a long uh, history as a, as a researcher, and uh, being a former teacher, right? To understand what it is that we're trying to do uh, leveraging technology to help teachers um, strengthen their relationship with their students or to think about you know, how we um, can leverage technology uh, in productive ways and ways that preserve and protect uh, individual privacy and, and rights to privacy uh, and so on. Um, those are things that are often not taken into account by the people who are uh, in the room, uh, software engineers or AI researchers. Uh, they know what they know. Uh, and I think uh, most, if not all, I think come to the world with very good intentions. Uh, but uh, to become a software engineer or to become an AI researcher, uh, no matter what um, the background is that you might have started from, along the way, the educational system scooped you up or kind of made a certain pathway available to you. And it may be very tough uh, to remember what it's like for a third grader in a poor uh, rural community or in an uh, urban center uh, that may be under-resourced. And those are the people who we have to kind of you know, call to mind as we think about how these systems are going to be put together and how we're going to provide uh, feedback or guidance to teachers who have to make on-the-spot uh, decisions about a room full of uh, students or individuals in that big uh, crowded room full of students. And, uh, and at this point, <clears throat> I know that uh, we have um, the good fortune of having uh, people here in the room with us today who are in learning companies and organizations that are dedicated to figuring out how we do a better job of serving all students. Uh, but these are the uh, kind of field level uh, considerations and system level considerations that I think um, um, uh, are vexing, right? Uh, and, uh, and they are not typically uh, discussed uh, publicly, right? This is the kind of um, messy stuff that we uh, often, I, th I think especially at higher levels, uh, tend to avoid uh, or discount uh, in order to push uh, different agendas or different conversations forward. Uh, so I would say, I think uh, for me, uh, the part of the um, potential magic of today's gathering uh, is that in a, in a way that is very similar uh, to what we uh, did when we first organized or started to invite people to consider 
uh, participating in the EdSafe AI Alliance, uh, we have reached out to a group of people who we know are interested and who are uh, working on uh, different aspects of these kind of issues so that we could create a um, 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 uh, circle of trust, right? To have that kind of honest uh, dialogue. That's one of our hopes for the day is that we can really kind of push ourselves and uh, you know, uh, put things out there. We may have to um, uh, try not to attribute <coughs> um, comments because I, I think I would like to keep lots of room for people to play the role of a devil's advocate and kind of really kind of you know, help frame some of the questions that can guide our thinking. I think there are things that we tangibly uh, need to plan for in terms of a, a very intentionally um, inclusive and accessibility and equity focused perspective uh, as we move forward. Uh, because I think the, the general way that the education marketplace, uh, if you will, tends to operate is that, uh, that um, um, investment capital moves towards the middle, towards the, uh, whatever the, the fictional uh, average student in the average school might be. Uh, and what we um, really can't do is expect that things that are designed for the mythical average student, average classroom, average school, uh, to expect that those are gonna work for the students who are really on the edge cases. Right, and so um, I think it's on us to think about how we shape the field, not just participate in it, uh, and, uh, and, and think about the complicated ecosystem that we're operating in. And so <clears throat> I might be uh, preaching to the choir, I think, like a good preacher. Part of my job today is to make you a little uncomfortable, uh, too, right? Um, <clears throat> or at least to give you some things to think about. Um, and um, so maybe what I'll do is, you know, kind of end, um, with uh, a little bit of a story kind of drawn from my own uh, professional past and then would love to get into at least some time for some uh, discussion. Uh, whether it's Q&A or whether it's a, a kickoff for a conversation, uh, we'll, we'll see what you all have in mind. Uh, but, um, but for me, this was a, a, you know, a matter of um, uh, working in higher education. I've had you know, similar experiences working in uh, technology companies and research and assessment organizations. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that I um, uh, learned and have tried to keep with me over time is the, you know, the um, complementary relationship between data and story, right? So I think typically when we're interpreting data, we are drawing inferences and we are creating a story or a narrative uh, out of that. And it's a story that we uh, often need to treat a little tentatively because we do have to take it out into the world and pressure test it, right, to see if it's accurate or accurate enough <clears throat> for our current purposes. And in this particular uh, story, which I inherited from uh, a former student affairs dean who brought me kind of into the work, uh, he had um, found himself one day kind of sitting in the comfort of the dean's office looking out across the uh, main campus lawn towards the library, <clears throat> and he noticed a large figure kind of with a shovel out in front of the library who uh, did not look like someone from the facilities of Roundtree. And he noticed shovels full of dirt. This was in a, a kind of a nice uh, fall afternoon. He noticed shovels full of dirt being flung over the shoulder of this person and he recognized the, the student uh, and said, oh, that's so-and-so from our football team. <clears throat> and he raced across the campus green uh, to intercede in what he thought was some kind of um, you know, nefarious activity. <clears throat> and he ran over, he um, yelled, Joe, what the hell are you doing? And, uh, and the student stopped, kind of leaned over, and he, he said, oh, you know, Dean, I'm so glad that you're here. Uh, you know, I, I came to the school four years ago, and, uh, and this is my, my senior fall. In the spring, my parents are gonna visit the campus for the first time uh, since I got here. And I'm planting some uh, bulbs now so that the library is gonna look really pretty the first time they see the campus. And he said, as a dean, he had to kind of pause and take a deep breath and think, okay, this is not what I thought it was. And now how do I explain the brusque tone in my voice and how I came here you know, just loaded for conflict? I think with the data that we have available to us, sometimes it, it tells an incomplete story or it misses the key elements that we really need to be focused on. I think to me the solution uh, for this, and I think partly why uh, I, I love the idea of this kind of a gathering, is that I, I think in a, in, a, uh, in a way that people in my tribe would recognize, uh, we recognize that everyone has their own story. Uh, but our stories are really not complete until we braid them together with the stories of the other people in our lives, the people we're living with, working with, 
uh, creating a life with, and the opportunity to have educators and policymakers and researchers and tech, tech people with much stronger technical backgrounds than me, and people who come at this from different perspectives, because each of you owns your own life story, a kind of unique story about how you got to be where you are today. Uh, what we have, I think, is a pretty unique opportunity if we can figure out the larger game plan uh, to have a corrective equilibrium or balance in the way that we go forward. We don't all need to do the same things. We don't all need to agree on every single point. But if we know who's doing what and how they're approaching this work, I think collectively we can be much stronger, much more effective, much smarter, hopefully a little faster than we would be if we were working in isolation. So um, I don't know if this is uh, at all in line with what Dale and Amy had in mind by inviting me to speak with you all this morning. But I wanted to just kind of plant those ideas and initial kind of reflections with you and then open things up to see what questions you might have for either of us or what um, comments you might want to you know, share at this point to help um, get our day get started. So. That's great. Thank you. I totally thought that was going into a very Mr. Bobby story. So, uh, <laughs> I'm glad that it, it which would have been fitting. It was, his part was on AI. Uh, so we probably have time for one or two <clears throat> questions. Uh, if anybody has any in the room or online. Uh, while we're waiting for a hand to pop up, I'm struck by when you ran through the examples of AI, it reminds me of when I put up the slide that had, there are all of these different privacy preserving technologies and some people might already be using them. I think that a lot of institutions don't realize that they're already using AI because it's being used to clean data or it's being used to impute missing information. It's like a model. You know, uh, but then when you talk about predictive algorithms, there's a whole different reaction that people have. And so I think that for this intro panel, there's a lot of similarity there because people, when they hear AI, they immediately think of the worst thing. And when they think about privacy preserving technologies, they immediately think of the most bizarre thing that they wouldn't know how to implement. And I guess it's just, it's, getting people to understand that AI is a whole yeah. suite of approaches. Yeah, yeah exactly. And I, I think you know, it is uh, too often, especially as we think about the broader public and how we have informed consent or a level of trust that allows us to push ahead on things, we really have to do a job as um, teachers and educators to explain ourselves and provide those kind of counterexamples and to think about how we reach the people and, and probably um, segmenting a little bit between uh, those um, you know, education leaders and potential partners or collaborators in the space, you know, right down to people who might serve on school boards or uh, vote in school board elections, right? Because they're, they're, uh, all of this becomes pretty high stakes. Uh, and it doesn't take very much to have a data breach or some um, uh, problem in the use of AI as, ha as happened in um, the UK with an AI model that was used to predict uh, likely test scores, and it gets like more and more probabilistic and problematic as you kind of you know uh, play out the string, uh, which would you know in the, in the case in the UK then ultimately lead to a decision about a student's college readiness and what their post secondary opportunities would be, all based on a predictive model, kind of an untested model using who knows what kind of data, uh, in order to um, say that it, it effectively. Um, based on things that you've done in the past, we have a, a dialed in sense of what your potential is, right? And uh, I think for those of us who were uh, not necessarily uh, assumed to have an incredible amount of potential as young people, or who might work with young people, uh, where we get to see their uh, real potential under the right um, circumstances just blossom, uh, those kinds of things, you know, we can understand why there is skepticism and distrust uh, out in the world. I'm John Medine, um, and I have a question that either one of you could answer, and that's one of the biggest obstacles that I see coming from an ed tech company is gaining trust in some of these hard, hardest areas. How, as ed tech companies, how do you propose that we approach gaining trust? Because I think there's so much to be gained, but it's such a hard area that even some of the scientists don't understand it. So how do you get you know, the, the average parent to understand it and gain trust in the system. Mm -hmm. I'll take a quick stab at it. Uh, I endorse more of a common vocabulary. 
so that when we're explaining what the application does, that we all start using the same words. And I know that this goes against marketing because you want to get them to do it yourselves. But I think that if you really want to win over the, the clients, and by that I mean whoever is going to be uh, using the service at the institution level and the parents, uh, you've got to get them to understand, oh yeah, that's like such and such. Uh, and trying to make sure that you're also making those comparisons to other technology in their lives uh, that they embrace that might not be identical but parallel. Uh, I do this all the time with family members. Like, oh, you use Waze, you use Google Maps, you have an Alexa. And getting them to understand the way that those things are working and how that has that touch point. But to me, it's all speaking through example, but also critically getting people using more of the same terms so that it builds that familiarity and trust. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, Amy's examples, I think, are really brilliant because I, I think in part, we do have to distinguish between marketing and broader communication, uh, right? Uh, there are different interests um, in play uh, there. And I think when we think about where we're starting, we do have to, we may need some other kind of um, you know, expert advice about how do we get out there? What common vocabulary do we use? How do we avoid the use of educational jargon as we're describing this or overly technical um, you know, explanations for things when what people really want to know might be much more uh, basic than that? Right, uh, and, I, and I think that um, this is one of those areas where, on, on the one hand, um, I think it's it's um, a big task for a single company or organization to try to take on, but it is the sort of thing that a collective might be able to organize around. Um, there um, are some things I think where, uh, 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 so there's at least a few of us in the room who spent some time working in uh, different philanthropic organizations. Uh, if we know that uh, the you know to achieve the potential of the use of data and AI that we have to address these kind of public issues. Uh, there may be some funders that are, would, uh, would be willing to work with different organizations to put together a communication strategy uh, with some real expertise behind it, and including um, how, to, how to reach the people you're trying to communicate with, print media versus social media, right? And any number of other ways to, to think about who the most effective ambassadors and spokespeople might be. Because it could be a teacher, or it could be a parent, uh, right? Who uh, who can really tell the story in a way that uh, that starts to dial things in for people. I think those are some of the things that you know that we should probably um, uh, be thinking about or carving out some time for. I, I will say, one of my hopes for this is that in doing the work or having a network of uh, organizations and, and groups involved in the work, uh, there should also be some differentiation. Right, between the organizations that are leaning into this who really want to commit themselves uh, to the work, and I say, so you all are the usual suspects uh, kind of in, in that discussion, um, and then those who are not interested in it, right? There, there should be some uh, way that the good actors become differentiated from others, you know, kind of in the space, and trust, I think, you know, may um, disaggregate in a, in a certain way uh, you know, over time, but we have to we have to see how it all develops. Yeah. So I think Dale is giving us the signal that our time is up Thank here, you. but we'll have a chance to catch up during the break. That's why we